don't have a problem with studio perfection and I don't really want to say that, this, that there's a right way or a wrong way to record an album but I just feel that this was the right way for me to get the, I tried to get the best performance out of myself um, so I, I don't really have a problem with any other way of recording an album and I'm not going to start kind of, you know, yeah. chastising other ways. Although I do some albums, uh, I have worked on, a, on albums in the past where there's been a lot of editing and doing drop-ins as you call it where you, you replace a line and I just sometimes, I think I was just shying away from I wanted, I wanted an album that I could believe in. Like I wanted to be able to listen to it and go, that is a recording of us playing. So um, I would say that I did go on that side of things, which is why we had lots of rehearsals before doing it. I wanted to make sure that the band, we all knew our parts and we all been practicing. I suppose it's kind of old school. Uh, how many times was it at the start? I'm gonna go after a fat, well, fat for a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you can definitely hear when a band have been playing together a lot. You can hear a recording and you can tell, I think, when a band are really in the pocket with each other and they really know each other well and that comes across and that's definitely something that I wanted. I wanted people to feel, feel like they were listening to us playing together as one and being really comfortable with the music and each other. Uh, first time round is the G minor, second time round is the G sus4, third time round is the G7. So it's all G? Yeah. It wasn't necessarily doing a live album. Mm -hmm. It's that like you wanted to play with the people live, but the reason behind that was because he didn't want to be sitting tracking in the studio, which is unnatural. Yeah. People assume that because you're a, you're a good live musician that you can then go in the studio and, and do tracking, and the two things are so far apart, it's okay. unbelievable, you know? I chose the Cary Place in Alapool simply because it's a really familiar, welcoming, lovely environment for me and then one in which I spent a lot of time playing. I played in the clubhouse about 10 years ago and I recall the people, the audience that is, being so close to me, literally three or four feet away if that, that uh, that environment was so scary that it really put the musicians and myself right on edge and made us play out of our skins because even though the number of people there was quite low and small, the fact that they were so close to us was so scary that it really brought out, I think, an exciting performance. You could see their eyebrows going up or down and you could really tell if they were liking it or not liking it. So it really enabled, uh, I thought it would enable us to have that empathy very much heightened and hopefully bring out a, a good performance from the band. Copeland? Well, that's a very good question, just on a larger general universal scale. Um, no, I, I love Kopi, as he's known, uh, for his incredible timekeeping. Uh, his ability just simply to keep time is absolutely second to none. And on top of that, you've just got his huge experience uh, as a drummer uh, within the jazz world, with the more rockier side of things. And um, yeah, I just love playing. I've also played uh, fiddle with Kofi for a number of years in various different outfits, like the Beatball Fairies or Session 9 for a while, the Able Fish, lots of other bands, and yes, that's, there's many, many reasons as to why Kofi And he's quite a character, eh? That would be an understatement. So, tell us about Kofi's character. Kofi's character? Formidable. Um, 
but scary at times, soft and cuddly, abusive, hilarious, good crack and a real twinkle in the eye. Oh, you're so pretty, Copeland. John Spears is an incredible bass player. Uh, I was introduced to him by Ian Copeland some years ago when I did a Celtic Connections New Voices commission and he is from the kind of jazzy world, although he is comfortable in many genres. Plays with Hue and Cry and is just a, a superb musician and he's got an incredible amount of funk, uh, which, I, which I like a lot. And, uh, yeah, John Spears is awesome. Yeah, okay. Thanks. This bass, this bass smells yeah. of dirty hamster cage. Eh? It is, it is. The, the bass smells of dirty hamster cage. Oh, oh no, thank you. Alright, next one. <laughs> <laughs> I won't Spears and Kopi are quite a, quite an old kind of working team. They've played together for many years on the jazz scene in Scotland and they are just like one. And they've got a lot of respect for each other. They go way back, so putting those two together was fairly, fairly logical and easy. So, like a solid rhythm section. What's, what does that mean to you? It means a lot. It means uh, I don't have to provide so much rhythm from just the fiddle, and just to play on top of that or in amongst it uh, is just fun. So it means fun. Yeah, I think in many ways Mark had the toughest job out of anyone in this whole thing um, because, uh, yeah, he was setting up the, the room, the live room for recording. Uh, he was playing guitar and uh, he was also, you know, involved in the arranging of the music. So Mark's been absolutely integral to this whole thing. I actually originally chose him because of his, his feel for chords and harmony. love his harmonic aspect, his groove, his slight jazziness uh, and um, he's an incredible studio engineer, producer, all-rounder and good bloke and uh, I just felt like that's a man who I trust. Adam seemed to put a lot of pressure on himself that night, which I knew he would, but uh, and he's good and he can deal with it. Yeah. But, uh, as I said to him, it's about five minutes before this. Is, but you're wishing you tracked it now. And he was like, too good. It's just you just the way it up even more. Yeah, I'm doing this again. <laughs> <laughs> but next time we'll do it my way. He does thrive on that though. Hi.
I would argue that the music on Squall is entirely traditional, simply because uh, I think traditional music the con is a concept more than a specific sound. And over the last few hundreds of years, you can clearly see in the in the tunes that people who write traditional melodies have always felt entirely comfortable with taking a little bit of popular culture that's there at the time uh, and incorporating it into traditional music. There's, there's shades of Baroque in some tunes uh, in the Noki collection from the 1700s. You can clearly hear Baroque influences. So that would have been quite radical at the time. So uh, this album, I've clearly just uh, felt quite comfortable with using various influences from the wider world and putting them in. So yeah, I think this album is completely traditional by definition because I'm just soaking up what else is whatever else is going on in the world and I can't imagine why you want to ignore such huge swathes of beauty. It's not like the traditional format of a guy playing a fiddle and three accompanists. Yeah. It's a band of four people. Yeah. Um, but also created the format where Adam is the singer and he's also the lead guitarist. Yeah. So he's doing both jobs. That was the thing to set up. You're looking at drums, bass, guitar. Yeah. And fiddle. And if you change that word fiddle to violin and see if that set up someone else of you know, a slight mark, a jazz tree or something or anything like that. So it was that. Those acoustical values were the place to start. Right. And then the rest comes into play, I think. Yeah. Because Adam, the style of this stuff is, it's multi-genre, you know? Right. It's, it is multi-genre. 